Remember on Sunday when I said later in the week we'd have reviews? Well, guess what? It's Thursday. You're not going to get much more later in the week than that. Welcome to the Cinema Savants Review Show, the one that has no real good intro yet. But I'm sure I'll come up with something eventually. This week, yet another abbreviated show because Lee still hasn't bothered to show up or call or anything. Fine, be that way. I blame Donna. So we've just got two movies to review this week, and both of them kind of kid-related. Uh, let's start with you, Todd. You saw a... It's kind of a documentary, but what is it kid-friendly? It is a documentary. It's... It, it, yeah, it's, I guess it's... It's not. It's about a kid's show. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's exactly kid-friendly because it's going to be over the top of the kids that the show is targeted to. It's a documentary about Mr. Rogers called Won't You Be My Neighbor. Um, it's not that kids would not in, well yeah it is more the kids would not enjoy it because it's it's an adult it's talking about adult concepts the concepts behind the show things like that so it's certainly not a movie that kids can't see but and there are lots and lots of clips from the show Mr. Rogers Neighborhood of course uh, but not really a kids movie but it is what it is is a terrific documentary awesome documentary uh, director Morgan Neville the gentleman who directed 20 Feet from Stardom which is an amazing documentary about the backup singers who were basically the, the bone, the backbone of the, the Motown sound. Uh, and that, that's just an awesome, awesome show. Love that. Love that movie. This obviously kind of a different topic going on talking about Mr. Rogers and his impact on children's television, television in general. Uh, one of the high points of the film is actually has been making the rounds on social media. People have probably seen the, the clip quite a bit at this point, but if not, uh, back in the seventies, public television was facing a, a funding crisis because Nixon was president at that point and he needed to cut the budget in some places. So where do you cut the budget? Eh, cut the budget from things that don't matter, like public television was his view. So they were going to chop twenty million dollars out of public television which which sound which what is that like two weapons on a, on a plane at this at this point but that was a that was basically going to just gut pbs back in the day and they had senate hearings they had a couple days of hearings and rogers goes i mean then the, the senator and who was running the, the head of the committee he pretty much looked like he didn't want to be there and he had already made up his mind and rogers steps forward and gives this impassioned speech about what his show does and what public television can do for children and his message was basically his main message was it's okay to be who you are that was his message always and basically in the course of six or seven minutes he changed the senator's mind and said well you got your 20 million dollars that was it I mean, just those few minutes with Fred Rogers changed the course for PBS, really. Uh, absolutely changed the course of public television. Now, I want to start off by saying I never watched Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I'm a little older, and by the time Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood started, yeah, it was already 11. So I was like, no, I'm not really going to be watching that show. Not, not my wheelhouse. But, and I totally get all the parodies that have come along in in the past and the this documentary addresses those parodies which is pretty cool has a segment of mr robinson's neighborhood with eddie murphy which is absolutely about as paradoxical as you can get absolutely hilarious oh my god paradoxical that's the wrong word that's the wrong yeah it was it was terrific and roger said yeah he was interviewed by david letterman back when david letterman had a lot of hair and it was brown and he said that uh (laughs) he said yeah he didn't really care about the parodies that much the only ones that bothered him is if they kind of attacked the message but if it was a him it's like it didn't really bother him either way uh rogers it, it addresses a lot of the weird rumors like oh he was a navy seal and blah 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 i was like no he does not a navy seal um he was from this documentary from everyone that they interview his sons his wife a lot of production crew that were on the show back in the day he was the guy that you saw on the screen that was him 
uh, uh, very, very genuine, very caring, um, just a really good person. And it's easy to make fun of good people. They're, you know, I mean, he is the, the goody two shoes. I'm surprised I wasn't written on his sneakers that he changed into when he came in the door. Uh, but the, the documentary, despite the fact that I didn't watch the show, and I would be much more likely to make fun of the show, the documentary is absolutely fascinating because of his conviction of how important it is to get kids to believe in themselves. And they address that because after, recently there has been criticism. It's like, oh, Fred Rogers is to blame for the, oh, I'm entitled generation. It's like, Mr. Rogers uh, told me I'm no. great. No, because he wasn't saying that, oh, you deserve everything. He was just saying who you are, that's cool. That's what he was saying. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of warts to be seen, and certainly not in this documentary. There is a moment where they, they're speaking with one of his uh, longtime players, Francois Clemens, who played Officer Clemens, a black gentleman. And he played a policeman. And this is in the 60s. Uh, this is when people were – they show footage of – a, a guy at, at a public pool pouring chemicals into a pool because black people are in it to get them to get out. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so this is the time frame. And when Clemens said, when Rogers uh, talked to him about playing a policeman, he said, he said, policemen were the people that he, as the last person he'd want to be, because that was the last person he wanted to see in his neighborhood. Cause it wasn't good news. Uh, and yet he just went ahead and did that. Uh, he did some groundbreaking stuff where there's a scene, and this has been on social media too, where Rogers is sitting in a little, he's sitting on a bench with his feet in a kiddie pool because it's a hot day and he's just cooling off his feet with a little hose. And he invites Officer Clemens, oh, why don't you join me? And he said, well, I don't have a towel. I said, oh, you can use mine. So the, the black gentleman takes off his shoes, puts his feet in the kiddie pool along with Rogers. Uh, that's a really powerful scene at a time when people were being kicked out of pools because they were black and, and neither of them melted. Yeah, exactly. No one, and that apparently confused clients. people. And at the end, and then they go back to that scene. Actually, it's, they redid it later, much later on because they're both significantly older. And at the end of that scene, Rogers is, is toweling his feet off, drying his feet, um, which has a lot of significance, especially when you re re realize, and as they say, that he was an ordained Presbyterian minister, which never came out in the show. But no. it informs... I remember watching the show and religion didn't come up. Never. But it informs his choices and his his beliefs, definitely. Um, and Clemens, this is enough, going back to the, if there are any warts, this is, this is it, the moment. Because uh, Clemens was gay, and he had gone to a gay bar, and Clemens is telling the story in Pittsburgh. This is where the show was filmed. And the next day, someone apparently knew that he was there, someone else who had been at the bar, obviously, or had a friend who had been at the bar, and told Rogers. And Rogers went to Clemens and said, you know, I'm sorry, you, you can't go there again. He didn't say, I'm upset that you're gay, nothing like that. But he said, you can't go there again because we can't afford that publicity. Would it have been better? For Rogers to support him and say, hey, you know, I, I dig who you are. That's cool. Like you do you do what you have to do to be yourself. He didn't say that because he was too afraid that they would lose the sponsors because PBS now and then had sponsorships. And he was afraid Johnson Johnson was one of them. Uh, they were not going to be down with uh, someone who was openly gay. He wasn't openly gay at the time. But if it came out, you know, so he asked him not to just to be careful about revealing that uh, but eventually he did make it up to him by talking about how Rogers would say oh I love you that kind of stuff and he'd do it on, on the show and at one point Clemens said he was he said are you talking to me because he's looking right at him while he says this and he says I've been talking to you for two years Dead. And Clemens just breaks wow. down because he said he'd never heard that. He'd never heard that from his father. He'd never heard that from his stepfather. And he said, so it's like Rogers became like his father figure at that moment. It's it's a brilliant portrait of, of, of a man who's like almost too good to be true. And, you know, God knows something will come out. Hopefully never does that. Oh, well, there's a reason that he liked working with kids. 
Um, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, <laughs> that, that wasn't it. No, it's uh, it's just an amazing portrait of of a person who is just amazingly good, and this is a really really good time uh, to have that. And they talk about th- the topics that he would talk about, and this is on a this isn't on just a kids show. This is like for pre K kids, and they would have a week where they talked about death. They would have a week when they talked about divorce. I mean, they would talk about all these really really challenging subjects for kids to handle and he felt it was so important that they know that they can they can handle these things um just just a great, i actually great remember when movie. they did that they, they they did the death uh shows around the same time uh sesame street did theirs because mr hooper died yeah on the show which was uh you know a, a tragedy for that show and they moved it I seem to recall them moving it through several uh, PBS shows. Just, just, just one of the things they did is just days, or maybe even the next day after Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, oh. they they talked about assassination on the show. Who does that? I mean, because and they, they don't even do that now. No, they, they go through the. It's too soon to talk about that. No, it's not. Exactly, and because he knew, as he explained, they're going to hear about it, and and it's. You've got to uh, you've got to be up front and address it. I think it was two days later that they're talking about it on the show. Might have even been the very next day. I think, uh, and that's incredibly brave to do that. And he he really pushed he pushed what people felt children could deal with because he knew they weren't able to deal with it without some help. And he was that help. Which. I remember Mr. Rogers being Mr. Rogers. I liked the neighborhood of make believe. Not so much, but <laughs> Mr. <laughs> thing, for me, things just got weird when they did that part of the show. Oh yeah. Very weird. Even as a little kid, uh, even though they're, they're doing puppets. Which you get the voices for all of them. Yeah. Uh, you, even as a kid, I could kind of tell that, that I was like, that sounds like Mr. Rogers Yeah. on helium or something, but you know, Whatever. Um, I remember Mr. Rogers being a, a very cool show and having good messages and stuff. And that that's something you don't get today from. No. I think I mentioned on the show uh, this past Sunday that you know Nickelodeon is supposed to be for kids and does some shows that are are just not. Right. And should not be. And I think we need we need more PBS. You know, the thing is, even Sesame Street is bailed. They're on HBO now, which is. That's just weird. It is. Uh, conceptually speaking. And it's unfortunate because Very. pretty much everybody can get PBS. It's like not everybody has access to HBO, which is sad. No. Not sad that you don't have access to HBO, but sad that Sesame you Street don't have is. Access to... Yeah, exactly. Well, Sesame, admittedly, I think Sesame Street's kind of gone downhill, too, since uh, since Jim Henson died. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I've, I tried to – I was brought up on Sesame Street. And I wanted my kids to kind of go through the same thing. And then everything turned into Elmo. Yeah. And the ADHD Muppets, you know, Bert and Ernie are gone and replaced with uh, Telly, the poster child for Prozac. And uh, what was the other one? (laughs) Zoe. Zoe needs to be tranquilized and put somewhere, you know, with a straight jacket. (laughs) That was a Muppet that had issues. Um, you know, it, it used to be, you know, here's how we can educate you by going through these situations. And now it's it, it's just not. Um, and I've, I've moved us into Sesame Street. And I didn't mean to. Back to Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers did the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Were, and it's, where I grew up, it was they were back to back. So it's won't you be my neighbor again? The name of the, the film and it just a awesome documentary it only has a 99 score on tomato on Rotten Tomatoes 97 from the audience um yeah it's a it's a great movie a great documentary um it's not a warts and all picture of Rogers but I have a feeling that's because there just aren't many warts to be found I suspect Um, that that's true too it's a great movie sometimes you just find a good person yeah exactly a really good person who did some really amazing things with what he saw as his mission Great movie. You know, uh, I guess I'll do mine now. The uh, which is 
kind of a kid's movie, and yet there are aspects of it that are not. Uh, from someone else who had a good, a lot of good vision, good visionary stuff, Hayao Miyazaki, who we haven't mentioned on the regular show in in a couple of weeks, actually, which is How did that weird because <laughs> usually. Usually we're like, oh, that's a good good animated movie, but not as good as Hayao Miyazaki stuff. Uh, and I don't know that we have actually done this on the show, which is weird, because it's actually my favorite Hayao Miyazaki movie, Howl's Moving Castle. Uh, which I know we talk about, you know, Princess Mononoke and, st- and yeah. Spirited Away. I don't think and, we mentioned Howl's. Not in depth, certainly. Not in depth. Um Howl was actually, I think it was my, the first high, no, it wasn't the first Hayao Miyazaki movie I saw, but it was, uh, I guess it was more recent than Princess Mononoke, which I think is the right. one I saw first. Um, the story for Howl is not, not entirely for kids. There are parts of it that you, you would have to explain, like, let's see, the short, short forming the plot, there's, a girl named Sophie who works in a hat shop. Boy, doesn't this sound like a good sci-fi movie that I'd like. No, it, it really is. Um, she comes across a, a wizard named Howell while going to visit. Now, the, I did get a bit confused on this part, whether she was visiting her sister or a cousin or just a friend. It doesn't matter. She doesn't show up for the rest of the movie anyway. Um comes across Howl who uh, helps her get away from some soldiers because there's the whole town is readying for war and I'll get to the war in a minute you have to pay attention to why there is the war Um, but because she comes across Howl a rival witch the witch of the waste curses Sophie to be an old woman and because she's turned into an old woman she runs away because she can't face her family and her co-workers and everything. And that's where, in the middle of the wastes, she comes across Howl's Moving Castle, which I love her first reaction to it. Uh, It's a castle that has these four spindly legs and is kind of shabbily put together. And her first reaction to it is, they call that a castle? (laughs) Which, and and when you see it, you go, really? That's, That's a castle. All right, whatever makes her way inside and meet, uh, I guess, officially meets Howell, uh, his adopted protege, whose name has just escaped me. Damn. Anyway, he's a cute kid. And Calcifer, the high and mighty fire demon. Calcifer is awesome. Really? Calcifer is a, he's a small tuft of fire that lives in the fireplace, voiced by Billy Crystal. Come on. (laughs) In the English version. Um, and the whole movie is how to get Sophie back to being her, how to get Howell's heart working again. That makes sense when you see it. Uh, how to get the Witch of the Waste back to where she's supposed to be. How to get Turnip Head, the uh, Scarecrow, back to the way he's supposed to be. There's a curse on him. We don't know what it is. Uh, how to stop the war that's going on. And if you listen to some of the background characters, because I missed this the first time I watched it. Uh, there's a scene where she's walking through an alleyway and at the front of the alleyway, there's some guys talking about how the prince from a neighboring kingdom has disappeared. They think we took him. That's why we're going to war. I missed that because it, it's just a hushed conversation in the background. Yeah. But it's actually said a few times through the movie. So you go, oh, OK, I get it now. And then that makes the ending of the movie make so much more sense. Um, it is a beautifully drawn movie. There's a lot of the, I guess, typical Miyazaki. Look, here is nature, un, unscathed yeah. by man, and you go, that that is pretty. Um, the rest of the technology is actually steampunk, which is not something I had gotten into before this movie, and to be honest, not really much since. But the way that they do this movie is it's beautiful it's fun there's a lot of a lot of excitement a lot of humor and then there's the part that's not exactly for children it's not it doesn't get graphic like princess mononoke does in a, in a few scenes right but the uh the witch of the waste has the i call them tar creatures i don't know that they actually had names but 
they they freaked me out a little bit. Yeah, they're pretty um, pretty scary. They're they're creepy looking. Um, now my kids, who at this point, yeah, my 17 year old is like, oh, pff, whatever, I'm gonna go watch a horror movie again. All right. Um, but my youngest one, who is still 10, kind of looks at them like. Those are creepy. Are they on the scene? Are they on the screen long? No, we're almost done. Okay, I'll sit through it. Okay, they're gone. I'm good. And watches the rest of the movie. So it's still, I wouldn't go much lower than, you know, 10 years old if you're going to show this to kids. Yeah, I agree. But ages 10 and up, definitely see it. It's a fun movie. It's got a good. Not quite as much Mr. Rogers in the uh, you should be yourself thing, which, okay, spoiler a bit, helps Sophie with her I am an old woman curse. <laughs> um, but at the same time, there's a good message to the movie. There, there's just a lot of stuff going on. It, but it, I think one of the things that I really like about it is that it's a movie you can watch multiple times and – each time you watch it, you get just a little bit more out of it. And to, to me, Which, yeah, to me, that's the hallmark of, of, of a really good movie. And it's certainly the case with Miyazaki's movies. Yeah. Uh, they, they, all, they all have messages and they don't hit you over the head with a message. And there's, there's so much going on in his movies. I was just flipping through and noticed that uh, I had never realized this until I saw this, that Miyazaki claimed Princess Mononoke was going to be his final film. <laughs> so he's in, the, Again? he's in the habit of saying, yeah, I'm done. It's my last one until this. Until I make this one. four or five more. No, um, know this one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, forgot this one. Uh, Howl's Moving Castle is not one of my top Miyazaki movies. Not like in the top two, which doesn't mean, I mean, it's an awesome movie. It's a great movie. I just think there are a couple others I like better, but it, you, you don't. It's you, hard for me to actually rank Miyazaki's movies because is. so many of them are just yeah, they're just uh, Kiki's Delivery Service. Kiki's Delivery, yes, that's one that, that that usually doesn't get thrown into the best, um, but it could be. But it's still it good. Uh, oh, it's Castle great. in the Sky is really good. Totoro and uh, my neighbor Totoro I love that movie I mean it's just and Princess Mononoke and Spirited Away usually get put at, right, at, the, at right. the top of the list and those are my those are my two but and usually it's Spirited Away but depending on it's like oh I think Princess Mononoke is better it's just and there are certainly days when my neighbor Totoro that's the best one uh, and and Howl's Moving Castle it is a great movie I don't, it's not just a good movie it's a great movie and there are there are not many movies like that for kids so. No, um, I think if you want to go obscure, even uh, Nausicaa of the Valley yeah. of the Wind was good. Uh, Porco Rosso, which I seem to have reviewed a couple of years ago, actually, I think it was. <laughs> have we been doing this show that long? Uh, yeah, Porco Rosso was a good movie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think you can go wrong with pretty much any of the any of the Miyazaki movies no. or anything that really comes out of Studio Ghibli. Yeah, I think it, exactly. Studio Ghibli itself is just does some amazing work. So Even if you go back to uh, Miyazaki's first film, which is actually part of Lupin the, Thir- the, Lupin the Third series, uh, The Castle of, I'm going to mispronounce this, Cagliostro, or something like that. Uh, even that was really good. Which I think is now on Netflix. It's either on Netflix or Amazon Prime, or maybe both. Hey! But... So there you go. See? Good stuff. Now you have things to watch when it rains this week or this weekend. And uh, Great. keep the kids occupied. Great stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, something else to keep an eye on this weekend. This Sunday, we're back with the news show. Stuff from Comic-Con will have happened. What has happened? I don't know. It hasn't started yet. Give us, Come back on Sunday. We'll, uh, we'll have more for you then. Have a good weekend. Captain, we're losing power in the warp engines. I think we should be leaving now. I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife. Uh, and on that unusually harmonious bombshell, it is time to end. I am very disappointed. Man, we have a weird job. It's shameful, but uh, eh, it's a living. And like that, he's gone. Dorn, that's the end. Thank <laughs> you.